So this week's video is a collaboration with James from Wood by Wright. And I have to admit, I was a little bit surprised when he got in touch with me, because this is the first thing I ever said about James on camera. Dude, you have got to be f***ing kidding me. So, yeah, there's context for that. You can watch the whole video if you want to know about it. But, so, not exactly the nicest thing I've ever said, and so when James reached out and asked if I wanted to do a collaboration, I thought, wow, what a nice, friendly guy. What a great sense of humor. Of course I want to do a collaboration with him. And then he said, how about we do a build-off where we each build a low-angle plane? And I was like, come at me, bro. For my low-angle plane, I'm going to make a miter plane. This is an older style of plane that's used for shooting joints straight and square on the shooting board. They used to be really popular, but they've kind of fallen out of favor in the last 100 or 200 years. A lot of woodworkers just shoot with standard bench planes, like the Bailey style one, but I haven't had great luck with that. It could be my technique, or I could need a better plane, and here's a good opportunity to make one. The only problem is, I've never used a miter plane before. In fact, I've never even held one before. But I've seen drawings and diagrams, I know what all the correct measurements are, and I know how to build a plane. So I can do this. But if I just go straight to the finished product, I'm guaranteed to mess it up. So I'm going to start off by prototyping. I started out by grabbing a piece of red oak, cutting into pieces, and then gluing and laminating those pieces together. Red oak isn't the perfect wood for making a plane out of, but it's pretty strong and I had it around so I clamped it up and let it dry overnight. After it came out of the clamps, I slabbed it off on the table saw so I had three pieces. Then I went to my crosscut sled and drew a 37 degree angle on it and put together a quick jig that would let me cut that angle really accurately. I'm going with a beveled down design here because that way your bed angle equals your cutting angle. When you go bevel up, you typically have to have a very thin bed, and that can be fragile, especially if you're working in wood. This arrangement's going to give me a thicker bed, and it's going to be more robust and stable. After I had it cut, I went ahead and glued it up. Now, I'm going through these steps kind of quickly here, but if you're interested in more detail about home plane making, you can look at my three-part series on making easy smoothing planes in the home shop. I've got lots of good tips on how to glue up, how to get your parts aligned, how to create a good mouth, all of that stuff. For instance, one of my tips is that you want to use a lot of clamps. Like, really, a ton of clamps is a good idea. And then while that was drying, I mixed up a little bit of epoxy and laminated together a couple parts for the lever cap. I used 3 16 aluminum plate and a piece of half-inch walnut. I clamped those together and let them dry overnight, then, after they were done drying, I copied the geometry from one of my existing lever caps, shaped it on the bandsaw, refined it with a drum sanding disc, tapped it for a quarter 20 bolt, and put the bolt in. Once all the parts were made, there was nothing left to do but assemble the plane and test it out. And I'm happy to report that it works really well just as a normal plane. It's not super comfortable to hold, but it takes a great shaving, and it makes me feel like this sort of build technique could make a great low-angle jack plane that you could build on your own and not spend a ton of money on. It also works fine on the shooting board. It takes a pretty decent shaving and leaves a good edge. But I have to be honest, if I just break out my regular old four and a half, that one does a much better job. So even though this prototype came out pretty well, it still has problems. For one thing, it's made out of red oak, which is a strong wood, but it's not particularly dense or heavy. I think one of the reasons my 4.5 works better as a shooting plane, even though it doesn't have a low angle like this, is that it's just heavier. You get a lot more momentum and you can just power through that cut and take a smooth shaving even through tough end grain. This plane, it's really light, and so it's just not ideal for shooting the way it is. Another problem is the lever cap. As I tension it down, the aluminum and the walnut are actually separating. So not only is this lever cap going to fall apart pretty soon, it's also obviously flexing. And that could be introducing chatter or alignment problems during the cut. It's just not a strong enough mechanism for what I need to do. Of course, none of this is a problem. This is why we prototype. 
For making a plane like this in the home shop, I'm not sure wood is necessarily the best material. Unless you've got something really dense and heavy like lignum or rosewood kicking around, you might want to try something else. Also, it's 2018. There's a whole lot more materials we could work with besides wood and iron. So, for instance, I'm going to go with Corian. This is a composite acrylic substance. You've probably seen it as countertops in kitchens and bathrooms. It's very strong, rigid, and it's not too hard to work with. You can actually cut it with any of your normal woodworking tools, including hand tools, which is pretty great. So I'm going to make a blank out of these. I'm going to glue up several pieces of Corian into the center section of my plane. And then I'm going to stick with the laminated construction because that's pretty easy to put together. But instead of using wood or Corian for the sides, I'm going to use this 1 8 inch thick plate steel. And the idea of using this construction is that by combining Corian and steel, I'm going to end up with a plane that's heavy, rigid, durable, and is going to slide really smoothly, both on wood and on the shooting board. Now, before I started this whole project, I glued up a bunch of samples of Corian using different adhesives. I used solvent cement, like you would use for regular acrylic, cyanoacrylate, super glue, and two-part epoxy. And you know what I figured out? Nothing. I can't tell any difference between the three of them. So I think the thing that makes the most sense is just to use good old super glue. It's going to give me a good bond, it's got a little bit of gap filling in case my pieces aren't exactly perfect, and it's cheap. So since I need to use a lot of it, it's not going to cost me much money. Once the Corian came out of the clamps, I squared it up on the table saw and cut my bed using the same jig I used for the prototype. Now that I've got the two pieces of my center section, I'm going to true up the bed, cut the escapement on the bandsaw, and chamfer over any sharp edges. Corian is a really strong material, but it's also brittle. So any very thin knife edge like this is going to be susceptible to chipping. Chamfering it and rounding it over is going to help prevent that from happening. And once these two parts are done, I can move on to rough cutting the steel for my sides. With my steel sides cut, I'm going to epoxy them together. This way, I can trim, shape, and drill both sides at the same time, and both pieces will come out identical. Now I'm using 5 minute epoxy for this, and it's got a handy property which is that it breaks down when it gets warm. So as I'm continually working on the steel, sanding it and drilling it, it's heating up and heating up, and right about the time that I'm done working on these two pieces, the bond has totally broken down and I can just peel them apart, and I've got two perfect sides. For the lever cap, I've got this great piece of aluminum that I pulled off the bottom of a pillow block. It just needs a little bit of this and a little bit of this, and some of this over here, and, huh, very nice. Now any good lever cap is also going to need a good screw. So I'm going to laminate together two pieces of black acrylic. I've got a great video on working on acrylic if you want to know more about how to glue it. Once I've got those pieces together, I'll drill them for the bolt that I'm going to use and glue the bolt in with epoxy. Then I'll rough cut the shape on the bandsaw, take it over the lathe, Turn it round, add a little bit of copper, trim and shape that, and sand the whole thing. And I've got a beautiful cap screw that only took about a half an hour to make. At this point, the individual parts of the plane are coming together really nicely. But you might be thinking to yourself, Hey Rex, that's a pretty looking plane you've got there, but doesn't it need a blade? And you're absolutely right, it totally does. So last week, I picked up a piece of 1095 high carbon steel off of eBay. I cut it and trimmed it to the size that I need, ground a bevel on it, built a forge out in my garage, heat treated it, quenched it, tempered it, tempered it again. Yeah, this was kind of a long process and I have a whole video about it. But after I tempered it the second time, I honed it up and it was perfect. Shaves a hair, nice and thick, and it's going to be a great iron for this build. Now the plane's coming together, and I'm ready to do a lot of the final shaping, and then of course putting in all the fasteners that are going to hold the sides to the infill. But I've got a lot of drilling and a lot of cutting that I have to do, and I want to keep everything sort of immobilized while I'm doing that. I've got the lever cap installed and bolted through either side, and that's helping to hold things together. But to keep it together while I'm working, I'm actually just going to run a bead of super glue right around the whole thing. And that's going to give me a pretty decent hold. 
It's going to hold it together long enough for me to drill and tap all of my body holes and to do all the shaping that I want. And then when I'm done, it's going to be pretty easy just to break this bond free and keep working. While I had the plane temporarily assembled, I realized it was going to be hard to get chips out of the throat, so I added in some extra cutaways on either side of the cheeks. I drew them in with a marker, roughed them out with uh, power tools and with a round file, and then I refined everything with a lot of different grits of sandpaper. I wanted a smooth finish here so it would be easy on the fingers. Then I moved on to the lever cap and polished it with a scotch brad pad in the drill press. I wasn't just trying to make it look good, I also want it smooth so it'll pass shavings easily. And then it was time to reassemble the plane, probably for the last time. I was originally going to use two-part epoxy for this, but I was so impressed with the bond I got with super glue that I decided to use that for the final glue up. Also, it dries pretty much instantly, and that let me finish the plane in a single day. I got the sides glued together, and then as I was putting the fasteners in, I also added a drop of super glue to the threads of each fastener. I'm trying to lock this thing together as rock solid as possible. I don't intend to ever take it apart again, so it might as well be one solid piece. And then while the plane was drying, I stuck a piece of 80 grit belt sander paper down to my table saw bed. It's the flattest thing I have in the shop, and it's going to let me lap that plane and lap it, and lap it some more. I started out just getting the bottom flat, and that didn't take very long because the Corian sands pretty easily, but then my brass screw heads were proud of the sides, and I had to work those down flush, and then I had to work on the sides themselves and try to get them polished and smooth. I used to watch people online making planes, and they'd use precision ground 01 steel, and I could never figure out why they went to the trouble. Well, while I was doing this, I pretty much figured it out. The mill scale and the low spots that you get with this hot rolled cheap steel, it's not very flat, it's very difficult to work with, and it's not as straight as you want it to be. So I had to do a couple of hours of really aggressive lapping to get the plane as flat and straight and polished as I needed it to be. I think the next time I do this, I'll just spend a little bit of extra money and get some precision ground steel and save myself a little time and sweat. After I was done lapping, I used mineral spirits and a series of different grits of wet or dry sandpaper to polish out those 80 grit scratches and get the sides as smooth as possible. After I wiped off the gunk, I was really pleased with the shine and the look of the sides. And then it was time to open the mouth. You file it a little bit, stick the plain iron in, check the blade with your finger, when it doesn't come out, you do it again, and again, and again, going a little bit each time until all of a sudden, the plane works. This is the first test run right here, and I'm just delighted with how it works. It's comfortable in the hand. I kind of modeled it after the Veritas miter plane, which can use on the shooting board, and you can grip it and use it for trimming long ends like this. This plane is taking an excellent shaving very soft, feathery pieces of wood, and the surface that I'm leaving behind is smooth. Of course, the real question is, how does this actually work for shooting? And I'm happy to say it works really well. It goes right through tough end grain, and I can tell that the low angle and the greater mass really seem to be contributing to a good plane. It even works better than my 4.5, and, and a lot better than the prototype. It's a little tough to grip, I might add a handle in the future, but I can't argue with the results. One thing I'm really happy with is the chip ejection. I've never had any problems with the plane clogging or jamming, and I've never once even had to reach into the mouth to clear out shavings. They just come falling out all on their own. So I really think the wide escapement and the work I did on the cheeks has paid off. Of course, the final question is, how's the end grain look? And when you've got a shiny, shimmery look like this on end grain, and it's square and straight, well, that's why you use a shooting board in the first place. And right as I was testing out my plane, James sent me the first pictures of his. 
and I was delighted right away. We both set out to do a pretty similar thing, make a low angle, bevel down plane, but we couldn't have gone about it much more differently. Where my plane is laminated style and made of weird materials, he went totally traditional and mortised it out of a solid chunk of wood, like a craftsman would have done two or three hundred years ago. At first, I didn't get why he had shaped the front of it the way he has. It seems kind of weird and asymmetrical, but then I grabbed a chunk of wood and put my hand on it, and I get it exactly. Your hand would fit those depressions perfectly. I'm still not sure why he made it so long. It looks more like a jointer than a smoothing or a shooting plane, but I haven't seen the video yet, and I'm sure it'll make more sense when I see that. I guess the real question is, how does it shoot end grain? And the answer is, it shoots it great. Those are beautiful shavings and a great surface. All in all, it's great work. It's really impressive, James. Nice job. You know, when you do most projects, you get an idea in your head, and then you make the thing, and then you look back and think, well, I got, I got 80% of the way there. I got 90% of my vision. And that's good. That's a win. Just getting close to your vision is a big success. But this project was actually really different because I had sort of a vague idea of what I wanted to do and then I made something that was much, much better than what I had in mind. And I'm honestly really surprised and delighted by how this thing came out. I think part of it was that I spent some time looking at the planes made by Conrad Sauer, who's a huge inspiration to me. My work is nothing compared to his, but I think just having the ideas of a master like that floating around in my head that really helped the finished product, and it helped me come up with something that I'm really proud of, and I'm proud to share with other people. Um, speaking of sharing, I have to thank my patrons from the bottom of my heart, especially my new patrons, Dustin Light, Robbie, and Carlo pa Carlo Pitt. Welcome aboard, Carlo. I'm very, very happy to have you as part of the channel. And if you've been watching this channel for a while and you're thinking about supporting it, I want you to know that now is a particularly good time. I've been working really hard to make more and better content, but I still make very little money off of these videos. And my main job is still furniture making and fabrication. And I'm really trying to make the transition away from custom work and towards doing more content creation. But every time I make a video, instead of working on a customer job, I'm taking time away from the work that really pays the bills around here. And the more patrons I have, and the more support, the more people who click on Amazon affiliate links and help me out that way, all of those things are making it possible for me to make a transition when my business is in a difficult and sort of vulnerable place. So now is the perfect time to come and be a supporter of this channel when it's going to make the most difference possible. And while I'm on the subject of thanking people, let me real quick thank James Wright again for reaching out to me and wanting to collaborate on this video. And he's just a, a generous and sweet and kind guy. And I hope we get to do something again in the future. So James, thank you very much. And to everybody who's watching, thanks for watching.